Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar presented by the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems. Uh, my name is Jim, and I welcome you, uh, people from all over the world who are joining us. We have some great information to share with you. And first, I'm going to turn things over to our host today, who is Becky Williams. Yes, Becky. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Becky Williams, and I am with the Human and Institutional Capacity Development team on the Livestock Lab. And so my team is responsible for helping to fill some of the capacity gaps. Um, and we've been to four of our six countries so far conducting analyses as far as, you know, what's really needed and the human training side and also the organizational side. And one of the things that has consistently come up in all of our partner universities is the need to access high quality journal articles and the challenge there is in um, accessing those when you're from a developing country. So we have asked our University of Florida libraries to come and give a series of, of webinars um, to, on how to access high quality journals um, when you're in a developing country and the constraints that you face um, from that. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our two speakers today. So we have Dr. Lenny Ryan. Lenny is a <laughs> university librarian emeritus from the University of Florida. And he's also the coordinator of, of Librarians Without Borders and the Medical Library, so he's with the Medical Library Association. And, and Dr. Lenny Ryan has been working um, with, uh, with this type of, uh, of issue for quite some time now, so he's very much an expert and can help with many of your questions. And we also have Michelle Leonard, who is um, an instruction coordinator and an ethics educator with the Natural Resources and Environment Library, which is our Marston Science Library. And we're gonna be seeing both uh, Dr. Ryan and Michelle um, over the course of a series of webinars, um, hoping to help fill this capacity gap. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Lenny, and he, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Okay. Okay, good afternoon to everyone in different time zones. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I think this introduction will be useful because it opens your eyes to a program that, uh, if I understand, all the countries in the grant are eligible for. So there'll be a, a, an overview today, and the next time we really want to focus on how you use these resources. And in the middle, what we will do is sort out registration, find out if your institution's registered, who the contacts are, how to get the email, uh, how to get the username and password. And please feel comfortable to interrupt at any time, ask any questions. And also, I want you to see at the bottom, this will be available on the website, right? And down there on the right, Michelle is the expert on this more than I am. But what all those symbols mean is you can really use this for educational purposes, you can edit this material, you can show it to students, you can show it to colleagues. And this will become even more critical as we actually work on using the material in the next webinar. I think that's going to be the second one. So I work for a project called Research for Life, which is, uh, involves a number of UN agencies. Obviously, the goal is to connect developing world researchers with the international science community, reduce the publishing gap, and there's a very nice UN sustainable development goal that kind of ties this together, ensure public access to information, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this program started out in health, but as of June, we have 8,900 registered institutions. And I've looked at the spreadsheet, uh, the list of the institutions that are in this project, and I think many of them should be registered. So that's my homework after this presentation to sort all that out. Okay, I can go on. Sorry about that, I just have to click on the screen. Okay, we're doing some technical. Okay, so this is the actually the website for all the programs, a lot of information about access training, uh, how to register and things like that. Uh, hey, Lenny, can, if you don't mind me asking very quickly, would you mind explaining to them what Research for Life actually okay. is? Yeah, they might not be aware. I, I may be getting, let me go back then. <clears throat> there are five programs here. And Hinari, okay, we'll start from the beginning. 
Inari is the oldest. It is health-related information. Agora is the second. It's agriculture and livestock, et cetera, et cetera, related. Oari is environment. Artie is research and innovation. And Goli is one that started in March for access to legal information. What these programs do is link your institution through after once you log in, you go to actually to Geneva and then you are linked to the publishers. So it's like an online library. Some of you may be familiar with this. Some of you may have vaguely heard about it. Some of you may have even used Agora. Does that help? You can, in, in, you can ask those questions anytime. Okay, so here are your eligible target audiences. And from what I understand, there are many uh, national universities or research institutes or in also some NGOs that are involved in this Feed the Future program. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, the thing at the bottom is that all permanent visiting faculty, staff, members, students, et cetera, can obtain the username and I username and password. There's one per institution. But this can get complicated, as you could imagine. So we have this lovely map. And what's important is group A is free. OK, all the institutions contributing, all the countries in this project are group A. So we don't have to worry about saying you need to pay $1,500 per year. Uh, the one independent variable, the one complicated thing is that the publishers can choose to make the material available. So some countries have better access than other countries. For example, if I remember correctly, some of the publishers choose not to make their material available in Ethiopia, whereas in Nepal or Cambodia, this material would be available. So we have key publishers, and you can see a lot of the major publishers are participating in this, and some are also, many are also making their books available. So there is a broad collection of material. I think it's 14,000 different journals and something like 46,000 different books if you're in a country that gets access to everything. And you can see the partners being uh, all the different agencies. And somewhere at the bottom, I'm with a group called Librarians Without Borders, which is part of the US Medical Library Association. Am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? Okay, because you know, usually when you're in a workshop, you get feedback and nonverbal clues. So we have more than 115 countries, areas, and territories. Uh, Hanari has 13,500 journals, 60,000 books. But the one we're going to focus on and the examples we're going to use today is, of course, Agora with those 10,000 journals and 2,500 books and 30 information resources, as we call them in the, the library world, OK? Uh, sometimes, I, I may want to point this out, if you're dealing with food security and health can play a part, sometimes you may want to also do your search in, in the health resources. So you're able to toggle back and forth from one and the other. And I also think that environment, which has a little different mix, may be critical for some of the projects that are going on. Is that correct? Yes. I see positive signs across the room here. <laughs> OK. And then uh, the one that doesn't really apply to you is now law and legal related content. But that's wonderful that we finally get out of the sciences and add is something that helps policymakers write uh, legislation and things like that. OK. What does all this mean? R4L copyright users agreement. Each institution has signed. And this is really gets into the material that Michelle will be talking about in other webinars. Correct me if I'm wrong. OK. And she's been very helpful for me to understand these things. All registered institutions sign an agreement. OK. What does this agreement say? You can share the username and password with colleagues, students, and faculty. You cannot share for, with those from outside your institution. I'll give you an example. If you're in Nepal and you're on the border of India, sometimes lots of the passwords get crossed to a country that's not eligible for the program, 
and they have to close down a password and get a new one for an institution. Or it's somewhere someone is using some robotics and just downloading hundreds of articles, and that will also be a red flag. Publishers can figure these things out pretty easily. So you're not supposed to use it outside the country, but in fact, we have a colleague visiting from Mauritius. He has come here for two months. Yes. Now it says one month's maximum. What we're now allowing people to do, and this is a real critical question, if you went to a meeting in Europe and all of a sudden, oh, I have great bandwidth. Let me, let me download all these PDFs. Okay, and we used to not allow it, but now this is allowed for a limited amount of time. Short-term professional trip outside the institution. So what maybe my colleague here would do is say, I'll use it for a month and then I'll close it down. <laughs> okay, and then there's something about distance learning courses, which I don't think will be relevant to our discussion. So copyright and fair use. This is like an agreement any institution in the West in a developed country would have with a publisher. You can download or print up to 15% of a journal or a book. You can use the material for educational purposes. You can make copies for institution members and students. So what I am going through this is it's pretty broad how can you, you can use the material, especially critical for researchers, to, so that when you're starting a project, you have up-to-date resources. You have a, have done a good literature search. And I think some of what Michelle will be doing is talking about how to search properly. Is that correct? in the future, not today. Okay, so we're trying to, maybe we're trying to draw you in with this presentation and then we can get into more specifics in the next six or seven. I see my colleagues saying I've said a good thing. <laughs> okay. So finally, you're not able to charge for documents, post content on websites or blogs that are publicly accessible, and of course download all the articles from a single issue of the journal. So we've got, given you a little background on all that. Uh, this is for, I don't have the slides for access to the agriculture program, but recently, thanks to a new authentication system, you can use mobile phones. Okay, so on the left is what, Agora will look just like this, and on the right is the mobile phone login. And I was recently, April, in a workshop in Egypt, and the, uh, it was in a very fancy military, US, uh, army house, hotel, but the internet wasn't good and all of a sudden people started pulling out their smartphones and accessing the program. And so I was very pleased to see that it really was working properly. So what will this look like instead of being horizontal, like on the left here, you'll get a much more vertical uh, version of it. But I just wanted to point that out because I think it's a very useful development. So, if you were to look up Agora, if you were to do a Google search and put in Agora and put in FAO, you would get to the link to this. Uh, I think my job after this is to see who's registered, who's not registered, to tell you how to find out your contacts if you don't know them so that you can get the username and password. So I'm just introducing that you can actually physically register your institution, but I would say wait until I've done my homework. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is just the registration form, and now if you register for one program as of 2018, you get all five programs at once, okay? So here we are on the initial website of Agora, Access to Global Online Research in Agriculture. And it says log into Agora. You get this username and password. As I said, it's institution based. Log in. And what is wonderful as of this year is you get all five programs. And then if you toggle back to the tab, you can go from Agora. Let me look this up in the environment database to see if there are any other key journal articles or book chapters that are useful. Okay, so this is very helpful. So what do you, I'm um, very briefly, I think, for a librarian anyway, <laughs> briefly gonna go through some of the features. The next presentation will be how to more, how the program really functions 
and we hope that you'll all have username, your institution's username and password, and then uh, we'll give you one page of assignments. Okay, and I'm, I'm happy to review anybody that completes the assignments, I will review it and grade it. Okay, if you're registered, the librarian should have the username and password. All individuals can use it. If your librarian does not have the login information, you're going to write to Research for Life help desk, and they're gonna say, here's the contacts in your institution. And then you're gonna say, these people left, and then we're going to get new contacts and eventually you're going to, we're going to try to do all this in the next five six weeks before the next webinar but i don't want to speak too much on it so we have logged in you can see that on the top it says login research for life and on the right side it says logged in i of course use a test account so you, i have access to everything okay so we've logged in do we walk us through what's on the screen we so we do that yeah yeah you mean Right now, like what are we looking at? Uh, I'm going to go through. I have slides okay. going through the next. Yeah, this is the what we call the content page, but I'm now going to describe the different parts of it. Okay, if you go directly to the program and have not logged in, you don't get access to much of the full text. You only get access to the ones that are open access journals. You don't get the ones from the commercial publishers. Okay. So it gives you another opportunity to log in. I'll give you an example of what happens if you do not log in. Okay, we have gone to the subject list and we're looking at animal science. And I think this is a, a subject list that would be of use to the people in these projects. And I think if I had the whole slide displaying here, there are 14 journal titles listed on what I've displayed, and seven are full access, which are green, and the other seven come from some commercial publisher, and since you haven't logged in, you don't have access. So that's why it's very important to get the username and password. Quick, 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 quick. You have a journal collection access, A to Z, A to Z list, as they say in most of the world. Uh, and uh, you can go and look up a journal title by alphabet. So I'm going to quickly display that part of the A list, and I have listed every journal that starts with AGR. But this is a very simplistic way, and you need to know your journal title. I mean, for example, there's one Agronomy for Sustainable Development. If you don't know that journal title, you're kind of lost. So a second way to look at it is by subject. This is what you were alluding to, right? Okay, so we're looking up food science and nutrition, which is a subject that you might also want to look up in Hanari, the, in, or a similar subject in the uh, health database. Okay, food science, nutrition, we get a long list of journals and books. Remember, I have this. I have a password that allows me into everything. Your list may, in the accessible content uh, drop-down menu, may be different. Okay, so we have 307 journals and 434 books. A lot of material. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily help you because now you know, oh, this is book, but I'm looking for a specific subject for a specific research project. So we'll kind of get to that. And we're gonna spend a lot of time in the next few webinars talking about how to physically identify what you want, correct? Right. Okay, so now there is an option that you can list, because uh, we do have several Francophone countries in this project. And you can actually list the journals that claim to have material in French. If you look at the list, you can see some seem to be in English, some seem to be not in English. But what we're saying is that these journals will have some content in French. They may have duplicate abstracts in French and English. They may have English articles and French articles. So there are 290 journals and 50 books that are in French. Okay, the, another key is this drop-down menu for 
publisher. The first thing it lists is what journals, publishers you have access to, and it also can be books. Okay, so we browse by publisher. First list is you have full access to, and there's a whole long list. Now I've gone in with a password from Grenada, which is a small island in the Caribbean, and some of the publishers say, no, we're not going to grant access. So at the bottom of this long drop-down menu list, you see the ones that you do not have access, full access to. Okay, so this can be very useful and save you from being frustrated. I'm actually moving on pretty quickly. I probably have about five, eight more minutes, and then we'll be, yeah. That's great. Okay. As long as I'm not talking too fast. And we'll have plenty of time like, for questions yeah. also at the end. Yeah. yeah, because, you know, doing these workshops, you end up having three different Englishes, and I'm trying to speak one that's kind of in between with not too many complications. Okay, databases for discovery. I call these little lists on the right to be underutilized resources. Databases for discovery, if you click on that, you get five or six or six, seven different databases. Now, notice Scopus is a huge database developed by a publisher. It'll be available in some countries, it will not be available in others. There's a useful environmental act index list that's a directory of open access journals. But the one we really want to talk about a bit is Google Scholar, okay? And I, I think some of you are from Ethiopia, and we were talking about this yesterday, that Google has restrictions. restrictions. So we're very curious about going into Agora and going to Google Scholar through Agora. Now, the reason this is so useful, okay, the reason this is useful is if you do a Google Scholar search just on the internet, on the right-hand column are all these links to the full text. Many will not work. The publisher will ask you for $35 or $40. We hear it. We don't want to pay. We don't. That's too much for us. Okay? So we know that it's impossible to pay for this. If you go through Agora, into Google Scholar, some of the publishers have linked, we have linked up with the publishers through the program, and you will start getting access to some of the full text articles from the publishers. So this is why it becomes a very valuable tool. Uh, Michelle, you will talk about Scholar at some point, or? Yes, that'll be part of the program. And then we will review this and we will see how it works because you know, literally, you can have a password and be doing it. Okay. So this is very valuable. And I also mentioned the Scopus, which is a large abstract and scientific database. Okay. The problem with Scopus is you're, it doesn't link to the full text. You would have to go back to the journal A to Z list and look up the title of the journal that way. Okay. Uh, there's also a list of reference sources. This was the second drop down menu on the right column. Uh, the third one is about free collections. We're planning to have a whole webinar, correct, on free collections. Uh, it could be journal direct, journal databases, it could be Google custom searches, it could be agriculture related databases, but we will spend a whole 35 to 50 minutes talking about free internet resources. That's on the agenda for the program. So I skip, 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 here we are. Last thing I wanna talk about. I've talked about you access through the title, you access through a subject list, you access through a publisher. You need a tool to do a keyword search, okay? And it's not the most sophisticated search tool, is that fair to say, Michelle? But it's what we have. Summon is a Google-like search engine that does relevance ranking. You can enter search terms in a single box and select the advanced search options, et cetera. There are some tools to limit or refine your search. 
what is so critical of it? And there are links to the full text material. What is critical is if you're in Ethiopia or you're in Nepal or you're in, is it Cameroon? Cambodia. 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 I know Cambodia. If you're in one of these countries and you do a search, you can have the search link to the material that is available in your country. So you're not getting frustrated. You're not going down to the full text and it says, oh, you're, you're, you're not eligible for this and you have to pay for it. Okay, so let me just show you what it looks like. We are putting in a global search for food security and drought. Okay, uh, it should say search inside Agora. I didn't change that in the box. Search inside Agora full text using Summit, food security and drought. Okay, but first I want to mention this. Most of the countries have country-specific profiles that links to what you are eligible to have access to, okay, what the publishers have chosen to grant access. So if you click on, say, Nigeria, you click on uh, Ethiopia, it will limit the search to what you physically can get to. So let's say quickly, quickly, we do a search, food security and drought. You can see on the left column, you have content type, journal articles, book chapters, eBooks, book reviews, okay? You can limit it by discipline, that's down on the bottom. You can limit it about publication date, okay? So this will be getting you right to the content that you have access to. This will be, a major part of the second webinar because we're going to physically go into the different into agora and use the different options and we will use some but just as a general overview i wanted to mention you have the the a to z list by journal title you have publisher you have language you have subject and then you have this search tool Okay, so that's really, I think I have one more slide. First seminar gave introduction, and we're gonna do future sem webinars. And the next one we wanna do is Agora and Summon Searching Plus. We hope we have sorted out the registration issues by then. And then we're gonna have another, I'm gonna do another web webinar on free internet resources. Ebooks, search tools, databases, including agriculture focus resources okay i think that's it for me okay so i'm just gonna this is becky i'm just gonna go ahead and um do a very brief uh recap of of what lenny's uh talked about and then we're gonna pass it on to michelle for just a few slides so just to, and lenny correct me if i make any mistakes so overall basically um what lenny has showed you are five or six five systems in which you can go in from a developing country and access high quality um, journals. It does require that your institution have, um, have signed up for the service and have a username and password. We believe that most of the institutions that we are working with on a livestock lab have access. Um, so one of the things that we're going to do between now and the next, uh, the next presentation is check and be sure which institutions have access if your institution doesn't have access, we'll be in contact with you to try to um, arrange that. And then we also will try to figure out who the contact person is at your institution for you to be able to access these programs. So to access them, you have to have a username and password, which is specific for your entire institution. And once you have that, you can then log into these systems and it will give you access to these journal articles that you will not be able to access if you just do a, a regular Google search. And as Lenny mentioned, there may be some restrictions based on which country you are um, living and working in, but, um, but there will still be a, a lot of resources that you may not have had access to before. Is that a very quick summary? I, I guess uh, I explained it well enough for Becky to summarize it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then um, we're going to pass it on to Michelle to talk about a couple of upcoming um, webinars. And just very quickly, the next one um, on Wednesday, September 26th, 
we're going to kind of continue on what we just talked about. So now that you know what these uh, systems are, um, how you can get access to them, and how you can log in, then um, Lenny's going to follow up with more specifics on, on how to use these systems to do research. We, I'm going to do my homework and see who has needs to register, which I don't think are that many, and which institutions are uh, currently registered. And Jim is going to send emails with instructions. Yes. Okay. So we will we will be in contact with with you about that. So now we're going to pass it off to Michelle um, for a few more a few more items. All right. Well. Thank you and welcome everyone. We're very excited to be here today. And so we've went over a lot of different resources that you can use for your research. So Lenny talked about all the different databases. So what does all that mean? So in this scope of future webinars, we want to not only share with you the resources you have access to, but how to use these resources, kind of a research project management life cycle and what all that encompasses to ensure a successful search, a successful research, and successful publications. So uh, just to recap, some of the uh, upcoming webinars are going to include the database training. And I invite you to send Lenny and I some of your research topics. So we wanna make it relevant to you, obviously, when you have a vested interest in the search, it'll, it'll go a lot easier for you to learn how to use all the databases. We will also share with you a list of the open access resources, and we will conduct a seminar on knowledge management software, meaning how to gather, store, manage, utilize all of your citations uh, when you do find the searches. Can I just mention we have a question here and we're, we're gonna welcome questions in our chat room and also in the Q&A section, um, but we can address this one right now. Someone is asking for the next webinar on Wednesday, September 26th. At what time will it be? It will be at the same time as this one at 8.30 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. Uh, so you know, based on the time that you joined today, it'll be the same uh, approximately a month from now. Okay, so uh, we welcome your questions and we'll get back to other questions um, after Michelle has finished her presentation. Thank you. Oh, someone wanted the slides. Yes, and, and this presentation and all slides will be made available on our website. We'll be showing that uh, URL at the end. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so other future seminars, we are also going to, in addition to identifying resources, databases to use, we are going to take a step back and talk about responsible conduct of research as well as research integrity. So some of the seminars we are going to cover is international collaboration, what makes it successful, how to be successful, and how to communicate with people in your research groups. We are also going to have a seminar on research misconduct. Uh, generally, the universal definition is falsification of data, fabrication of data, and avoiding plagiarism. So with this workshop, we want to bring you the tools of the definitions, the scope, the parameters, how to recognize it, but also how to avoid it. Can I interrupt you? Uh, Michelle helped my program and me specifically write a module on plagiarism and copyright. And I have to say, it has the most citations, footnotes, references of any <laughs> module I've done. <laughs> You always have to cite your source. <laughs> is that good? And I, Do as I, I say, say, yes. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and we'll also, in this seminar, take a look at some of the research misconduct, how it happens, how it occurs, and have a lively discussion in case studies. So this isn't, these seminars are just not going to be lecture. They're going to be hands-on. They're going mm -hmm. to be interactive. Mm -hmm. So you understand and can recognize all of these um, issues. We are also going to talk about ethics of authorship, which I think is very important, especially when for international collaboration, talking about what comprises authorship, 
versus acknowledgement in an article? How do you list authors, first author to last author? And some of these issues to work through and guidelines to create as you begin writing and, but taking a step back, how to develop these guidelines before your project starts. We will also go over some of the peer review um, issues, open peer review, single blind, double blind peer review, to give you an idea of when you do submit to journals, what type of peer review to expect. So with the peer review also comes conflict of interest, how you can navigate through some of the issues of conflict of interest, how to incorporate that in your acknowledgements and to have a transparency. We'll also talk about data management of what to do with your data. How do you store it? How do you preserve it? How do you share it? When do you share it? what do you share and who has the authority within your project to share this data and how to keep uh, the best practice for a lab notebook which is very critical we'll also talk about um, mentoring uh, what it takes to be a good mentor and mentee and so that kind of rounds out the seminars on research integrity if if Michelle allows me, maybe we can do a little looking at uh, authorship skills websites that are good tools on the internet. That would be a great idea. Okay, yes, we'll add that like to new or like Owl or. Did anyone ever has anyone ever heard of Author Aid? Not. Okay, well, we could call it up now, but it, there's a whole program to help people in developing emerging countries, low-income countries, whatever term we're using today, uh, publish. Oh, okay. And it even has a mentorship program in it. That'd be great. So I, I could say, and there are some publishers that have really great uh, tools where, you know, you can go in and do self-study on this. Right. And, okay, so we'll add right. That. and before each of these seminars, Lenny and I will get together and send out some homework some examples and then we can discuss it during our webinars to make it more interactive and if you, you have any questions you coming type up. that in author aid and how you spell it is it one word uh, i think it's a-u-t-h a-i-d dot i-n-f-o i could be wrong about the okay so we can search for that later. Okay, it, it, it may not be info, but definitely look up author aid. It's from a group called INES, which I forget what it stands for. Yes, so okay. we yes, so we are very excited to bring all of these seminars to you. And again, they will be interactive. We will have links, homework, mm -hmm. interactive activities, case studies, as well as some videos. So some of the resources available now, uh, Lenny touched on the Directory of Open Access Journals, as well as the Research for Life, and we will be bringing you a seminar and overview of R and how to get started with R, download the R Studio, both in English, and we also have the French version of R and how to uh, utilize it in that language. So with that, uh, we would like to open it up for questions now. So if you have a question, please type it in the chat window and we will, um, we will go through and address those. And I'll get things started. I have a question about um, the research for life because I saw you called it R for L and uh, I had never heard of Research for Life before. Can you explain uh, who runs the system? It seems like such a huge resource, okay. and where, where does it come from? It's, it, of course, that's complicated. Uh, in 2002, the first program became available, which was the Health One Hanari. And it really is a partnership between publishers and UN agencies. So the first started with the World Health Organization. The second one was the Agora with the Food and Agriculture Organization, with FAO. Okay, what happens is the UN agencies serve as a university. 
okay? But we just are not dealing with one population. We're dealing with a broader population of 8,900 institutions now. So the agency serves as a university, which if you're part of that university, you then get access to resources. If you're here at the University of Florida, you go to the library page, the library system, you log in and you get access to resources. So we're functioning as a, what could you call it, a mega portal, mega library that allows researchers and clinicians in health and students to access current information. Because as Becky found out when she went to four countries, everybody said, oh, we really need access to current literature. And that's how I got hooked up because I'm one of the trainers for Research for Life. Is that sufficient? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have another question here. Um, is this available for NGOs working with Feed the Future? And what about not working with Feed the Future? So Feed the Future is our um, umbrella term that mm -hmm. um, all of that the Livestock Lab is working under. So let's, let's first talk about the NGOs because that's a little bit more yeah, tricky. Yeah, NGOs become a gray area. If it's a locally based NGO, they can register. If it's an international NGO, then the publishers say, oh, they should pay for this material. The international okay. NGO should be paying for it. Yeah, right? but so if it's locally registered, uh, or if you're working, if you're from, uh, um, I don't know the ones in agriculture. Give me a. So Heifer, Heifer International. Yeah, Heifer International. Which is US based. Yes, in would US not be patients. eligible. Yes. But if they're partnering with a small NGO in the country, the small NGO can register. I hope that answers it. Yeah. Uh, it's n not related to this project at all, Feed the Future. Yeah, it's not related to Feed the Future. So you, so academic institutions, regardless of whether or not yeah. they're with Feed the Future, if they're in an eligible country, should have access. Yeah. Are there other questions? Someone asked about sending the slides. So the slides are going to be posted on our website, and we will send out a link for you to access those slides. Any other questions? I'll give you just another minute or so to, to think. Well, my, my hope is if you're in an institution and you're just finding out about that you're registered for this, that for the next workshop, you bring some of your colleagues, okay? We will have some exercises after that I would like you to send back. As Michelle says, we wanna make this interactive and hands-on and have you learn the actual skills. But if you're in a lab or you're in a research project and your colleague next door doesn't know about this, have him come to this, him or her, come to the next presentation. Yes, we'd like to highly encourage that. Is this, this is, these resources are a really great way to access the, uh, the literature that you, you cannot access through a regular uh, search query on, on, uh, on like just like using Google or even in some cases Google Scholar who will often show you a lot of resources that you have to have a login to get to. So um, please bring, um, let your colleagues know about the next workshop and we will also, and also please give them the link to this workshop so that we can get you all access to these resources. From ILRI, is it possible to access from ILRI? So ILRI is an international organization. The so, International <laughs> Livestock, Livestock Research, Research Institute. Institute. So I'm gonna say it's unlikely because unlikely. it's an international, it's internationally funded. Um, if you have a contact within a university, you know, if you have like a secondary position within a research institution or a, or a university ministry. that might be, or the ministry yeah. of governments, then that would probably be the better way to go. Yeah. We'll, we'll check specifically. I, it's highly unlikely that Ilri. No. I mean, that's like saying FAO. <laughs> yeah. Any other final questions? All right, well, we would like to very much thank our two wonderful librarians from the University of Florida who came um, to present to us today, um, both Michelle and Lenny, and you will be seeing them again. And um, the final link to see the presentation is uh, right up on the screen for you. You'll find it at our livestocklab.ifis.ufl.edu.
Um, what do you know which page it's going to be on? On the, the events page. On the events page. So we will hopefully uh, see you virtually in, on September 26th at the same time, 8.30 right. Eastern U.S. time. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I also just we'll want, be back. Yes, yeah, <laughs> a special thank you to our librarians. Uh, Lenny Ryan and Michelle Leonard for being with us from the University of Florida. And I just want to say goodbye from the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Livestock Systems uh, coming to you live from the University of Florida. Thank you. Have Thanks. a great evening and the rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.